Seriously, Krasinski needs help. Like, yeah, dude. <laughs> or he needs none at all because the guy's a yeah, he's, like, dude. Yeah, Maybe man. the first movie was a love letter to his kids, but this movie is a cry for help. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> To the What's Our Verdict podcast, where we fashion ourselves cinematic judge and jury. My name is JJ Crowder. I'm here with my co host, Tavia Ortiz. What is up, my nerds? Ian Anderson. Some shit. And our very oh. special returning guest host, Alec Burgess. Hey, guys. Good to be back. We appreciate your help growing the podcast. Go ahead and hit that follow or subscribe button. Tell a friend about us. Check out our website, whatsoverdict.com, where you can listen to all of our episodes, sign up for our newsletter, get exclusive content and updates, pick up some sweet, sweet merch interact with us in many different ways and listen to our what's over to tv podcast as well the question we always ask is if you ever find yourself wondering if you should spend the time money or both on a movie to help with that question each week we put a movie on trial discuss the facts pass judgment and let you know our verdict using a zero to five scale today we're reviewing a quiet place part two it was released may 28th 2021 it was written and directed by john krasinski stars emily blunt millicent simmons noah jupe and killian murphy following the events at home the abbott family now face the terrors of the outside world Forced to venture into the unknown, they realize the creatures that hunt by sound are not the only threats lurking beyond the sand path. So, if you haven't seen this movie and you're finding this first, we will be spoiling it. So, if you want to avoid spoilers, go watch the movie, come back, pick up where you left off. You can also check out our spoiler-free review on YouTube. Just search for What's Our Verdict and you'll find us there. Check that out to see if you should go see this movie. And then, yeah. If you don't care about spoilers, if you've seen this movie, hang out with us. We're about to spoil the shit out of this thing. So, let's, let's dive deep, guys. Okay, this movie's nuts because I was concerned, to be honest with you. Look, I've been excited for this movie for over a year. We were going to, we reviewed the first one, which we didn't end up posting because the audio actually sucked. And I just can't, after doing, figuring out audio for the most part, I couldn't put that shit online and actually be proud of it. So we may release that down the road as like a special episode for those that have our newsletter. But for now, that one doesn't exist anymore. But we did that one in preparation for this movie back in March of what I call COVID year. So 2020, we didn't actually get to do this movie. We were all really bummed. It was going to be the first like really big movie we were planning on doing for the podcast. So it's come full circle over a year later. And man, I'm glad it did. But I was worried a little bit because it is a sequel, as Javier mentioned in the spoiler free. You just don't know what sequels may not turn out very well. And that's scary for the movie. The fact that I loved the original of this so much, it makes me nervous every time. But this movie did not disappoint. And that was keen on the opening scene that Javier missed a few minutes of. But I love that scene because it just showed how like small town normal this town was. And these people were like sitting at this baseball game asking about, man, what inning are we in? And he's late. So he gets his oranges and shit on credit or whatever from the dude at the pharmacy you get that cool callback of the rocket ship that his littlest son grabs in the first one man it just was such a great way to open the movie to get you comfortable with and remind you of what you saw in the first one what do you guys think i think they also played it well in a way of making you uncomfortable because they open up with this scene of the town and it's just got the traffic light cycling through and you're like okay what's gonna happen and then lee drives up and goes in and grabs some oranges and you're like oh Okay, we're all right. We're okay. <laughs> and then it leads into that, like, day one. Because when that truck sh- drove up, I was like, oh, shoot, what the, what's this moron doing? Like, you can't be loud in this in this <laughs> yeah. day and age. Like, And then he pops up. I was like, oh, okay. It's it's not now. It's before. Um, before this happened. I loved it. And then just the casual conversation at the baseball game, like, made me smile. But he sits down and he's like, how many times have I been through the order? One, three. And he's like, oh, shit, I'm a bad dad. <laughs> like, <it's>, uh, <laughs> and then, then he asked him to get the one, the other baseball game playing on the radio. And like, it just reminded me of like when I was a kid and playing little league baseball or high school baseball. And like, that's how the people in the stands were. You'd have a radio going with like the pro game in the background and people just cheering you on. I just, it was really fun and con- kind of calmed you down. But like you said, Ian, there's this underlying tension throughout because you know, the shit's coming and you've already seen the explosion in the the pharmacy or the little market store that the guy's like, oh, yeah, I think it was a bomb. And so, you know what's about to happen. And so there's just this like uncomfortable tension right out the gate. Ugh. I love the way they played the meteor too. like the kids sitting there getting ready to bat. You see that he's kind of a chicken shit. He's scared of everything, which we learned in the first movie. But you see how deep that went because he's not even going to swing that bat. 
not a chance. Yeah, being scared of aliens eating your face off if you step on a twig is one thing, but you know, getting a getting a change up right down the middle of the plate is <laughs> completely different. <laughs> yeah, tossing salad up there. Fun fact: Alec I and I totally played little league kid. together. Fun fact: Javier bats like that Ooh. kid. <laughs> well, fun fact that is true <laughs> also i have baseball cards of our team so i have little 11 year old alec a baseball card of all his little baseball stats i need to find it for you guys there many there weren't That's many fantastic. it was like you know Bench warmer, 35 games. <laughs> he had the strikeout record, so. Yeah, p- played nice. left out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I want to find it. I wouldn't know. I was I was a Little League All-Star my entire life, so. <laughs> and I like to watch scary movies, so, yeah. Okay, wow. <laughs> I'll be making this thing all day, dude. <laughs> Ian, you were getting ready to say something before we start talking Little League. Oh, I was going to talk Little League and say that I was that same kid. So oh, Apparently, I'm in a <laughs> podcast with a bunch of unathletic individuals. No. <laughs> I don't know. Javier just did win, what was it, the fourth grade girls boxing title of Utah? <laughs> Second. <laughs> I, I, I Second didn't read the whole story. I just, I just kind of browsed. Yeah, I was going to say, he didn't actually win. He took second. <laughs> uh, I, no, I just browsed no. the story. I didn't look. But yeah, that was no. cool, dude. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. nice. feels, feels a little cheap now, but I appreciate it. <laughs> well, no, I was, I, I'm glad we brought it up, though, too, because I did mention it. Like, I put in a plug. I was li- editing the last episode, and I was like, shit, we never talked about the reason Javier's not here, which I won't mention the real reason, and it's just because he just didn't watch the movie. But yeah. I was busy. <laughs> this dude was a huge jacked dude i was worried about other things okay i get it i get it no but he was out taking second place becoming the second ranked heavyweight in the state of utah so we do want to congratulate also thank you i did watch army of dead that's a terrible movie guys so i I agree with your assessment that's good that's good but back to uh a quiet place too now that Mm -hmm. we've gotten that out of the way (laughs) so this yeah i will say that when the meteor starts coming down, the way they played this thing was so dirty because it's moving slow. And you think you've got all the time in the world before these things come, right? So everybody's moving. They end the baseball game really quickly. They're all going to their cars. They're kind of taking their time because, again, I think they thought like we did, that thing's not going to hit and it's really far away. And then I about pissed myself because they're all getting in. They decide they're going. They're splitting up with the parents. And then this first monster comes out and just obliterates this dude out of nowhere. And it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and I was so sad that Javier was late because he didn't get to see that one. But, oh, yeah, bummer. dude, because it comes out of nowhere. You think you have a few minutes because of how slow that thing was moving. Nope, it was there. And it just, it just, this dude just disappears. <laughs> it's crazy. And then all hell breaks loose. Because they're just tearing shit up, and then you get the the scenes from like the the credit where the she's in reverse in the car, and the ones crawling out of the front window of the bus. Oh, it's a fantastic shot. I did watch. I did make it for the scene in the diner. Yeah, Krasinski and his son, and the phone rings, and then the monster like dives in. Who who doesn't have their phone on vibrate or silent? Like what? I wouldn't. Oh my Just gosh, so you know, R two D two would have killed my ass. My text some of you guys R2-D2. grew up in normal functioning families, and it shows. <laughs> and that that's going to cost you during the apocalypse. Some of us actually answer our cell phones when they go off too. So. <laughs> See, I think after seeing the guy get chewed up in the street, I just would have flipped it to vibrate, you know, right? call my mom. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll get back to you later, mom, once I'm done dying. So so, so that's not going to vibrate. Dude, if I got absolutely mauled in some diner because some chick can silence her iPhone, I would haunt her family for the rest of eternity. (laughs) How pissed I would be. I will say, though, that I I had to go get Javier to get him into this movie. So we're standing in the hallway. And right as we get there, it's when the the shop owner is saying the Lord's Prayer under the table. And like that was the first thing we see in Javier. We hadn't even gotten it where he stops in the walkway going up to the seats and he stops and goes, shut up, man. (laughs) 
What are you why, doing? <laughs> why would you be, even if you didn't know these things are like, like they're hearing. Auditory is, hunter. Yeah. yeah. Why would you just be mumbling if there's some alien creature outside? You're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm a man of faith, but that guy's an idiot. And then his stomach growls, and he like literally <laughs> smacked his stomach, like telling it to shut up. It was the greatest thing. <laughs> it was funny. We had fun. I think that's one thing I love about these movies is the atmosphere that it brings into the theater. Like, if you eat your your like rustly like popcorn, or you, you, know, you make any kind of a movement, you can feel everybody around you just like shut up. <laughs> and it was just it's super. It's super fun to watch a movie like this in the theater because of the atmosphere that it brings, which I haven't seen done very often. Speaking of popcorn, JJ gave me a big old bucket of popcorn and I'm eating it and I'm like, you know what? I probably should not be holding this. <laughs> Little does he know, look, I don't eat the popcorn very often. Look, I was starving. I hadn't eaten dinner. I bought the popcorn, one, because I was hungry, but two, because I wanted to give it to Javier later. He'll tell you, that was the first thing that I did. He sat down, I was like, you want popcorn? <laughs> Yeah, I, I hadn't even sat down. I couldn't even find my seat because it was so dark. Yeah. I was like, what's a popcorn? I didn't even think it. I was like, yeah, of course. Of course I want popcorn. He sits down. He goes, I don't know that I should be holding this. <laughs> and it's a good thing, too, because that would have gone everywhere yeah. in that train. With the crows. Oh, God. Yeah. Absolutely. The crows gone everywhere. Yeah. That, that shit fun. was great. The other thing I love about this movie and both movies really is like the – they ramp you up to the level of just extreme intensity. Like with this first scene, this cop's trying to shoot this thing with a shotgun and then it cuts to a black screen and we go right to immediately where we left off in the first one, back at the house, the barn's on fire. They just killed this monster using the, her little ear, her cochlear implant. So you're just like, wow, that's, and then you, but it's one of those things where normally in a scary movie, when that happens and they cut, like you can relax. This movie's not that way. Like you immediately go to my body says I should relax based on what I've seen in previous horror movies, but my head's going, dude, don't relax. This John Krasinski's an asshole. He'll scare the shit out of you two seconds after you think you should be okay. Yeah, dude, who hurt this guy? Yeah. <laughs> Michael Scott. Yeah. <laughs> and I just love that this whole like the first one was a love letter to his kids. Like, you are a twisted son of a bitch, sir. Yeah, those poor kids. <laughs> So oh, when they it. cut from the black and take us back to the present, this is where I had a teeny bit of a problem with the movie. Because didn't the last, the first one end with like the two others coming through their wheat or their corn after and they only killed one the other one, right? Yeah, because yeah, he's they made a big thing about the three. There's like three in the area. Uh huh. And then they kill that first one, and then it kind of cuts with the other two coming towards the farmhouse. And then we kind of, <laughs> yeah, we awesome. go back, yeah. and then there's no more talk about these two that were like coming towards the house. I'm assuming that they're dead. Well, they, they pan across one that's dead on the stairs. Yeah, and that was okay. the first one they killed. That was one that they killed. But then when she takes something off the shelf, they show another one in the background dead on the ground. Ah, uh, okay. So I only counted two dead. I only counted three. two as well. Because I was looking for the same thing. I was with you, Alec. I was like, whoa, hold on. Because I did watch the first one again before I went and watched the second one the first time. So I was like, I have, but it, so I was, yeah, I did the same thing. I was like, wait, but I did see the second one. So I assumed that the third one was there somewhere and they just didn't show it. Because you're right. They, I, they pan to that little whiteboard where it's like three with big, thick box around it in the area and they only show two dead. So, and granted, I'm sure you could have counted wrong. I don't know how you'd tell these things apart one from the other, but that, that was just the one thing. And it was easily forgivable because this movie did everything else. You know, oh. what it's supposed to do with the, the suspense and the thriller. They did that perfectly. And this movie wasn't even necessarily in the works. So to take a complete story and attach it to a first complete story so well, I was like, okay, you know, I, I can forgive that. But I was yeah, counting. Yeah. I was like, hey, there's, there's, one, there's a couple that are missing. <laughs> I was worried about with it being like an unplanned sequel. Like there was no plans to have this more than just one movie. Nope. And I was worried about them forcing it, but I, I'm extremely impressed with how they did a sequel that was not planned. I guess I'm a little unclear why they left. Do they leave to go follow the fire? Do they leave because the barn was on fire? Like, what was the motivation for leaving their house? Because at this point, if there's only three in the area, those three are dead. And this is like the safest area you can be in. Yeah, but at the same time, like, it's obvious we learned that they can hear from for a very long ways. And I start because I thought the same thing, Javier. I was like, why are you leaving 
And then I thought about it. They got a busted water main that's flooding their house, or at least the the barn or whatever it is, which is going to, it's going to cause problems. And then you got a barn that's on fire. Your house is shredded and you can't fix it. You know what I mean? Because if you start mm. banging nails and you start turning on saws and turning on blow torches and shit, you're going to run into that same problem. They're going to come in and trash it all over again. So it's one of those things where you got to go find a little bit more secure shelter than what you have there because everything's kind of shredded and it's not like you can go call a contractor and or even turn into a contractor and fix it yourself because it's just too much noise involved so i think well, that's kind of I, just, I think that's the reason can i just say how much of a badass evelyn's character is this oh. lady has just she stepped on the nail which they showed that nail again and i was like almost audibly cursing it yeah uh, but having just given labor She's shot three of these things and then prepares her kids to take this like day to two day journey. I just think her character's freaking awesome. So I thought that was. I could not imagine a woman giving birth and then going shotgun shooting and then going for a hike. Yeah. <laughs> that blows my mind. Yeah. And not, not only that, but going into water where they just, she just had a mo- probably one of the most traumatic experiences of her life to find an oxygen tank to keep her baby quiet and alive. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, she's a complete and utter badass. And Emily Blunt, like, I don't know that there are many actresses that could pull off this character the way that she does, because she makes it seem so fucking effortless. Like, it's just a natural state of who this woman is. Like, and it's the same in the first one. Like, when she's laying in the bathtub giving birth and all she's doing is, like, screaming and she is able to hold off that scream until the fireworks start. Yeah, it, it, one of my favorite characters in cinema. And Emily Blunt's one of my favorite actresses out there. She's so fucking badass. Dude, now we're on the topic of trying to suppress screams. The bear trap? Yeah. <laughs> Ian told me to shut oh, up. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Which he's is like, so you need, bad for. Yeah, he's like, you need to reel this back. It was horrible. Oh. Yeah. See, I hated that because in like the trailer, it shows him running through and then it shows him just going underneath the your rail station or whatever it is. And so I was like, OK, cool. That's what happens. And then, no, yeah. no, they, they left out the convenient little part where this dude just steps right into a full blown bear trap. That yeah. got me. I, I was about a foot and a half, you know, 15 inches off my seat. Yeah, I didn't I think I was that loud. loud, Ian. Well, you were loud. It was great. Um, to be fair, man. I, I was probably wanting you to be quiet so the monsters wouldn't come too. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that part hit because here, here's the funny part. I had already seen this when I watched it with you guys. So I was able to watch your reactions more as much as I watched the movie. And I've never seen Ian so uncomfortable in my life. And I've <laughs> seen Ian pretty uncomfortable when we were playing D and D and in other situations like, just hanging out with me and my potty mouth makes him uncomfortable sometimes. So it was great because his hand was on his face like all the time. Like he couldn't. And I remember when this happened, like Javier like screams and the whole theater laughed at him because they were like screaming because he's just like, oh, God, boy. <laughs> I don't even remember that. I thought I winced. I didn't even realize I was still making noises until Ian told me to shut up. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Yeah. And then the whole movie yeah. theater starts laughing at him. And then I see Ian over there with his hand on his face, and I'm just giggling, going, "Oh, this poor bastard." To be fair, but yeah, it's a rough I, all part I said to watch. Was like easy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's partly because you screamed so loud at the first. You probably you probably scared him more than the bear trap closing on the kid's <laughs> leg. It was like it wasn't just the bear trap, but it was like the noise of the bear trap, right? Because at that moment they're running from the inevitable fact that one of these things is going to show up. So you're already like hyped up. And then this thing just snaps. And I'm like, Whoa! like I don't know. There's just a lot of emotions at the time. So yeah. very sorry to Ian and everyone in that theater. I don't was, even apologize. It was entertaining. Yeah, it was a lot yeah. for me. I struggled well, with I, seeing it. That's what I had a hard time mm. with was when they show like his these gashes into the leg and you're yeah. trying to keep him quiet. Oh, man. Yeah, can you imagine, like, the one thing you should not do is the one thing that you are absolutely going to do. How do you not? You can't. How do you not scream like that? Absolutely no way you're not losing your shit right there. Mm -hmm. Brutal. Well, and then I'm watching this dude that's got the gun sighted, right? And you know Killian Murphy's in this, and they've already set up, you know, the relationship of this family with this guy, that they were friendly, that they were, you know, he having communication with with the the oldest daughter and so it's like 
you know that these guys were close. And so you start to wonder the same thing that Evelyn's character is, is where the fuck have you been? Right. And then he's got this sights on everybody. And I'm like, dude, shoot this thing. Like at least try. But then at the same time, you're like, would I shoot it? Would I risk the shot? Oh, fuck. I don't know. I don't know if I would. No, I would say you wouldn't because you're, you're taking one shot with a rifle and you've seen these things blow through all sorts of metal and, I'm sure they obviously they know they can't just kill him because that was such mm-hmm. a surprise to him when like they saw or he saw through the scope them shoot the one with the shotgun. But yeah, I, I say I, I wouldn't be taking that shot. Yeah. And they move so fast, dude, when they're chasing him, like right after this, when it's chasing him through that warehouse and how smart is it to put a bunch of barrels and stuff for it to just collide into and make a bunch of noise, right? Like, I'm like, that's brilliant. What is, that's awesome. But the way that thing is moving, when it jumps up onto the rafters, it's like, (laughs) I'm like, that is straight out of like a horror game. I swear. That's like, that's like straight out of dead space. I freaking (laughs) hated that so much. That was rough. But yeah, I love it's just the visuals in this movie are crazy. The camera angles that Krasinski uses to keep the monsters in sight, but they're very rarely the focal point of the scene. They're just in the background just well enough that you're like, oh, fuck, run <laughs> faster or shut the fuck up. Don't make any noise. You know, and it's just so uncomfortable the way he shoots it. It's so good. You know, I learned about this thing the other day called Uncanny Valley, which is the explanation for why we get so uncomfortable with humanoid looking creatures. Mm -hmm. I was like this whole concept of like things that can look human-y, but not too human-y like cartoons, like Mario, right? And we're okay with that. But once they start looking like a quiet place monsters where they're humanoid looking, but not close enough to humans and also not far enough away from humans, that it makes us really uncomfortable. And I just like really think it's interesting how well they tap into that idea of like, this thing's got a head and it's got four limbs. It's got little fingers, but it's it's also terrifying. Yeah. It's got a mouth and it's got ears that you get to see quite a bit. And yeah, yeah. it's It's, human-esque. It's fair. Very humanoid. It's messed up, dude, is what it is. Seriously, Krasinski needs help. Yeah, dude. (laughs) Or he needs none at all because the guy's a fucking genius. Dude. Yeah, Maybe man. the first movie was a love letter to his kids, but this movie is a cry for help. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> well, here's the here's the best part. Like, cause, and Ian, you mentioned it was an unplanned sequel. Like, the studio went to him and asked him to make a sequel because of how good the first one was. He had no intentions. So now the guy's got to write a follow up, and that's intimidating as shit. Like, if you do something as successful as A Quiet Place, and then you have to turn around with out planning on doing it and write a story that continues this journey of these characters that we've fallen in love with and really are, are rooting for and to do it in the way that he did with this because you believe it you, you know you start to and you continue rooting for these characters down to even this kid who's just a big scaredy cat and he goes through this hellish thing but he still tries to tough it out in so many ways and tries to be smart and then oh god Millicent Simmons that girl is man she's amazing that actress oh Love her. And she, she's from Utah. Yeah, I represent. Man, when she heads out on her own, though, and you finally get to, like, you're kind of like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And it's interesting to watch because when she does start getting in trouble, you can see her, like, realize, like, how ill-conceived her plan was, that she can't work the radio and shoot this thing at the same time. And it just reminds me of, like, yeah, that's something, like, a young teenager or, you know, young kid would do is like have these grand plans of what you want to do and how you're going to make things better but not think it through enough to yeah i there's the writing and the characters in this and the development it's oh, it's so good i don't know how to express how good it is because i just love it so killian murphy's character was like we didn't come find you guys because the people who survived are not worth saving so he just assumed that they were just savage crazy people yeah and i would assume that you know, there's a lot of people, and we get a glimpse of that later on in the movie, which I don't want to get too far into because I know Javier's got some issues with that scene, so we want to talk about it. But obviously, we see later on a scene of some humans that are a little nuts and have some issues. So I think, yeah, that's the assumption is he thought, I can't trust that they haven't gone batshit too and aren't going to try to just like, murk me when I get there. <laughs> I feel like for me, me, like the idea of traveling is just too risky yeah. um, with what you'd have to do. Like, 
I think that's why I wouldn't have ever gone searching for anybody else because I'd be so concerned with just like me and mine. But I, that's my, my thinking on it. But I also get where Evelyn's coming from, too, because Lee had done so much to try to attract people to say, hey, we've built up some sort of a version of a safe place here, you know, with the sand path and the house that they've pretty much soundproofed to a certain degree. And they've got obviously a farm that's functional to it. They've got the grain. They've got things like that. So, you know, I can see where she's coming from. They were trying to signal people. And, you know, to your point, Ian, it's it's hard to get up the gumption to actually make that transition to go, I'm going to travel out there and take that risk when you may be in some sort of a secure situation, which it seemed that he was for the most part. So quick question. How do you get a working farm without making any noise? Keep it small. Yeah. <laughs> the thing wasn't small. It was like an acre of like farmland. Well, I don't know. Dig? That. How do you, how do you dig it? How do you harvest any of this stuff? Well, actually, yeah, from, from, cool. yeah, from somebody that Casey's got a quite the little, urban garden out in our front yard and like when she's out there digging like the dirt's soft enough if you've got especially where this is obviously a farm that's been there for a while like you could go out and do most of that by hand and not actually make very much noise at all if you're using the right tools the little hand shovels and the i don't know what they're called but like you don't make a lot of noise the dirt's usually pretty soft now here in utah that's a different animal because we have the rockiest fucking earth on the planet so you're not gonna make you're gonna make sound because you're gonna go to shovel and hit a boulder the size of your head that's Dude, buried under our dirt but utah is the hubris of mankind the fact that we're looked at a desert mountain landscape we're like we're building a city here and no one was like it lacks all the basic resources like water <laughs> <laughs> let's just start there all the water here is salt yeah, salty. So yeah, anyway. Well, and Alec is in Arizona, which I've lived in Arizona. It's fucking hot. Talk it's about dry. hubris. Why is what? there a fucking city anywhere in Arizona? You want to know what? The, well, I ask that question every time. Every day I lived there, I ask that question. Why does this place exist? But it's only because of the heat. To be honest with you, and this will surprise you, per capita by state, Utah is the driest state in the country, including Arizona. Arizona, because of its northern, the, the northern part of Arizona, and then a lot of the western area in Arizona, actually gets more water per year than we in Utah do. Wow. I feel like as silly as Utah is number one for all the wrong things. That's fair. Like That's that, fair. we have like the highest pornography consumption per capita. <laughs> Just doing my part, Javier. Just doing my yeah. part. <laughs> most, of that, most of that's from JJ. <laughs> He's the outlier. <laughs> I can tell you what made me mad about the traveling in this movie. Uh, so mm -hmm. she starts off, you know, following the train tracks and she walks into a dark tunnel. And I've I've hiked along train tracks before. I don't know if Javier, you were there with us when we did that one hike. But you go into a train tunnel and you don't see anything like you cannot see the ground. You cannot see even sometimes where the tunnel ends. You can. No, I wouldn't do it. That's where I turn around and go back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried. This, this was fun. Never again. I noticed that too. You're going to trip on something. You're going to hit something. She's at a huge disadvantage because she can't hear how much noise she's making. I'm like, I understand she's lived in this world for a long time, but like, you're yeah. really banking on the fact that you're going to see this thing before it hears you. Well, and it's proof positive in that train, right? Like she goes and reaches in for that. And then the dead body falls and scared the shit out of Javier. And then she gets to turn around and she can't hear. And this is the part that I wanted to talk about. I mentioned it. The use of pure silence in this movie is fucking unnerving. Mm -hmm. So he did it once in the first one at the end, near the end of the movie, where it goes completely silent from her perspective, where you can't hear anything he does it like four or five times at least in this one and i my skin crawled every time it happened because you just don't know we become as moviegoers and we're watching this so attuned to these monsters by the sounds they make as they're coming because you can't see them very well because they're usually coming from distance so that noise of them running through the woods or the the screams and the roars that they make and when they cut that silence off it, it's like cutting off a part of what you're used to to keep yourself from shitting yourself during this movie and it just makes me so uncomfortable and i love that they do it and show you what it would be like to be her and then you see that the camera pans just enough to see that thing crawling into the train and she thinks she's in the clear until she turns around and you're like she can't hear it she has no idea it's there oh so uncomfortable well that's the part that you know talking about and that that's what i was thinking leading up to that i'm like how are you gonna hold this thing and rack a sh shotgun 
Because that's what she had, right? She had a shotgun. Yeah. yeah. Totally yeah. Which we see didn't work out very well. And if it weren't for Killian Murphy, she would have been done. And like, honestly, I thought that made sense. Because assuming that they have buckshot in there, buckshot spread is not a lot. It's, yeah. It spreads like a couple of inches. So you have to hit this thing in the head, right? Which is not easy to do with a shotgun that has no sights, really. It just has like the little iron thing. Trying to do it as a kid, like there's a ton of kickback with 12 gauge. Like there's all sorts of problems just with a kid that size handling a 12 gauge shotgun shooting buckshot at this thing, let alone trying to do other things. Yeah, and one-handed. I was just curious. So, so she clipped it, right? I'm trying to remember. She clips it and then Emmett yeah, comes in. Yeah, because it turns. Yeah. yeah, like I think it hits it. Oh, okay. she, it turns and then like turns back at her. Yeah, and part of it was too, like she she waited or she didn't wait long enough. Like, and I get why, like you panic, which I loved this scene because it was real to me. Like she's in full panic mode. She's trying her best. She's learned what she should do, but you just because in reality, I was like, no, 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 don't shoot, don't shoot. Just wait a little bit longer. Put this and thing then, in its mouth. Yeah, Make it you need deep to, throat the barrel of the yeah, shotgun. Yeah, <laughs> and then you need it to be closer. And but she panics and shoots, and it doesn't actually do anything to it really, except knock its head to the side. And then you just go into oh shit, and it can't. And, you know, and you knew Killian Murphy was going to come, but there was that moment where you're like, rut row, we're in well, trouble. She now. like gives up. Yeah, too, right? She like figures out that she can't do it and then she just like winces and like curls up in a ball. I'm like, who wouldn't do that? Oh, of course. Right? Like, yeah, that was such a cool scene. Terrifying yeah. scene. Seriously, because they use the lack of noise two different ways in that. One, when they're walking up, you're not deaf with her yet. It's just silent, right? Like you hear like the cicadas in the background type of thing, but it's just like otherwise just quiet. And then the crows freaking fly out and that rocked my world. I forget. Because I'm like, I knew something was coming, kind of. But also I didn't. Because I feel like they also lull you into these like false senses of security, right? Because like there are times where you don't see monsters, right? You're like, there should be like in the warehouse when it chases them and then they dive into that thing. I was like, dude, that thing like should follow you in, but it it doesn't. So you're like, okay, maybe these things have got, maybe these these people have got these things figured out. I don't know. My mind was going a million miles an hour, to be honest. (laughs) And you see all these like decomposed bodies, right? It was just a very intense scene. Yeah. And then they did what you were talking about, JJ, where they make you deaf with her. Yeah. And that's like those two levels, because that whole scene is just silent, mm-hmm. right? Like crazy, crazy cool scene, terrifying, awful, hated every second of it, but it was, it was cool. It's amazing. Well, then we go to my, probably my favorite scene in this movie was when they escape the train and they go into the train station to hide from the other one that was coming. And it leaves and they start having this conversation where he's in full panic mode. He didn't want to go out and get her. The mom, Evelyn, begged him, guilted his ass into going and getting her, which what a great speech from her. You know, you said that they're not worth saving. And if he was here, he's gone. But if he was here, Lee would tell you she is absolutely worth saving. So she guilts his ass. He goes and gets her. And then they're sitting there and he's telling her, I am taking you back. And that whole conversation between the two of them, I was Don't very talk about my wife. I was yeah. like, Ooh. Well, and then he's trying to communicate and she's not getting it. And he puts his head down because he's frustrated. And I love the moment when she gently puts her hands on his cheeks and she lifts his head and she tells him, whispers to him as best she can, enunciate, remember, like she's calling on this relationship that they had, which you can tell they had at the baseball game when he asked her, you know, how do you say dive? Which we knew was going to come back into play from the very beginning, which was ends up being cool. But I love this oh, just tender moment. Okay, so I missed that part. That's cool to yeah, know. Yeah, you did miss that, that part. That would have been cute. A little cute connection. Okay, got it. Yeah, at the beginning, he asks her, How do you say, how do you do, how do you say dive? And he shows her, she shows him, and he's like, Really? That's it? And Krasinski's character is like, Yep, it's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that he was in the beginning of the movie with them. Yeah. So that's actually, that's, yeah, that answers yep. some questions. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there, there were, they developed that relationship and that there was some relationship, but I do love that moment when she, she goes tender with him and then she tells him, look, we have to do this. I need you to help me. And really just kind of plays on his heartstrings. But then I panicked when she wakes up and she's all alone. I wondered for a minute, did this dude just fucking bail on her ass and take what he needs to keep himself safe? Because he gives you the indication he's that kind of dude when he's talking to Evelyn or he could be that kind. So I had a real panic moment the first time going, oh, shit, he might have just stole her shit and left. Yeah, I was like, what kind of douche robs a girl, a little girl that leaves her for dead? Oh, 
Oh, man. It's nuts. When, since we kind of like broached the topic of Emmett, I love how they did his character. And I thought it was interesting too, because it's kind of almost like the opposite of Lee. What happened where for them, Lee died, they lost the father. Whereas for him, he's the last one standing. Um, you know, he's lost his wife and he's lost his kids. I really enjoyed seeing his character going from this like closed off, selfish, don't like let him in. I uh, can't help you. They keep moving to somebody who ends up following Reagan on this idea of like, we can potentially have a weapon against these things by using this radio station. So I, I just want to throw out how much I loved his character development. Um, and especially after the doc scene, dude, once he did that, I was like, this guy, this guy's my favorite, man. Oh, it's good. Okay. So to talk about the doc scene, I don't yeah. have a problem with like the way that it was made. I think I just have a problem with the plan of the crazy people, right? Cause like okay. their plan was wrap a rope around Emmett's neck. And then it's a bag of, or like a string bag, whatever of bottles right, to make some noise. And so like the standoff is if you make noise, one of those things is going to come and kill you. Except the thing came and killed everyone. Of course it would. We just went through a movie and a half of these things showing up and just obliterating anything, living or not, in its path. So these guys, their plan was, we're going to make, we're going to give this guy stuff to make a bunch of noise. And then we're all going to come out of hiding. And then we're going to kidnap this little girl. And he's not going to move or make any noise. He's just going to let us take this little girl because one of those things might show. Like, of course he would weaponize that. But what the f- if you if you put me in a situation where I'm dead, no matter what I do, I'm going to take people with you. Exactly. So, yeah, I totally agree. Sorry, Alec, I kind of cut you off. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say Javier is not going to be around at this point. He's already dead in this film. <laughs> um, but he's not going to understand how the crazy people work. Day two, Javier, you're done Dude, day two. The meteor lands on me. Just <laughs> right on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> but I was locked into this and I was saying, okay, you know, they're banking on the fact that this guy's like them and it's all about self-preservation. And then you throw in the fact that he's traveling with this girl. So obviously she means something to him. We're going to put him in a, you know, situation where, hey, she's either going to live, but we're going to take her and you're stuck on the dock or you make noise. Things come. Everybody dies. Got to think of it like a crazy person. I guess that makes sense. Sure. So then he wraps up this dude, stabs him in the leg, which I'm like, obviously, you've got to do that. And he jumps into the water right as that thing starts just absolutely violating this dude on the post. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a rope wrapped around his neck and a knife in his hand. Doesn't put two and two together. It's just being strangled by this rope underwater. Has all the tools necessary to solve this problem and does nothing. Well. I think we give people too much credit sometimes, Javier. That's what you said. Sure. I mean, let's I'm think just about saying, this. you would not give this credit to other movies. If this well, was Warrior, you would not be given this credit, you know? <laughs> That's because Warrior was so poorly written. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't you give either, me a reason you to make it. You give people credit in these situations or you don't. No, you have to earn the credit. And this movie's earned the credit because it's been realistic up to this point, right? Like, they write to me things that are realistic in this movie things go well things go shitty based on decisions that are made this guy's got a rope around his throat he's taking the time to not only get the monster towards him to save the girl but he's also stolen back her cochlear implant put it in his mouth it's my other issue i don't think that would have worked why because like i need to watch it more closely i'm pretty sure at some point when he's in water he opens his mouth nope I watched it the second time watching for that very thing. He doesn't open his mouth. He doesn't he, crush it in his jaws, his saliva. There's no saliva in his mouth. Like everything is just, he's just got a waterproof mouth. Good for him. I mean, you he know? doesn't have waterproof. That must be, a, there's, that must be an Irish thing. There's going to be saliva in his mouth, obviously, but it's going to do far less damage than losing it in the lake. No damage, apparently. Well, to be honest, well, anyway, cochlear implants are built pretty I mean, sturdy, this dude too, because had you got to walk time. around in the rain in them and you got to do so they're designed to survive. They're, they're water resistant, things like that. So having it in his mouth, okay. other than him biting on it, I give you that. I mean, if he cr- clenches down on it at all. But, I mean, I'm just impressed. This dude was being strangled underwater. Couldn't think to cut the rope with a knife, but he did have enough 
thought process to not bite down on this thing or not open his mouth. Like, good, yeah, I mean, good for him. Well, and that's why I'm saying he didn't think to cut the rope because he was thinking about so many other things, not the least of which trying not to get strangled to death by the monster. I feel like that would take priority. priority. I don't know. That's kind of a hard cut. You got you're underwater. You're getting jerked around. You got to find the rope, find the knife. Apply yeah, pressure. You take the also, that hard enough. to keep your lips absolutely clamped <laughs> shut to not allow for any water to get in. That also not, seems like a tough sell. Not to mention the fact that that was a pretty thick rope. It's not like yeah, he's just going to take you. one strike of that knife and it's going to cut Maybe through. Maybe if it. it's if it's that tight. No, Top I mean, that was like easier a, to cut through. Oh, sure. But that was like an inch of rope that was like not. And we're not talking about like twine here. That shit was some thick fucking boat rope like that. Shit's not just going to cut. Plus, he's got to think about keeping his lips shut. So he can't worry about cutting the rope at the same time. He's working exactly. his lips. Exactly. What would be the point of keeping your lips closed if you just die in the water? On the off chance. And I get your problem. But well, that's that's an issue. My other issue is I am do not get how these creatures like move through space, right? Like they can't see. So in my mind, they should just be colliding into anything that doesn't move and doesn't make noise, but they don't, right? They're like running through forests and stuff and not like hitting every tree. But then in this scene, they jump from a dock onto a boat. Actually, no, now I get it because there are people on the boat, right? So they heard them and then just jumped to it. How yeah, do they know they, to jump? How do they, they, they just run? Up. I think they half jump everywhere they're going. That's like the, the amount of speed that they have and the elongated limbs and they move very quickly. But yeah, I mean, you could get down to the nitty gritty and really nitpick the thing. But I do love when he jumps to the boat and sends the guy flying across the dock like <laughs> with yeah. one swipe. That sucks. And I think what's interesting for me about these creatures before I jump back and a little bit before the dock scene and talk about something I want to talk about that they don't they're obviously not killing for food. It's like these things just kill for the sake of killing. Yeah, dude, that's what would happen if cats got big, <laughs> right? <laughs> like domesticated cats turned into tigers and then yeah. they just mauled some shit. Yeah, dude, if t- if cats can move that fast and like kill that lethally, oh, uh, no doubt. All right, so I want to back up a second right before this doc scene because the lead up to this doc scene is one of the most intense things and one of the most genius edit- pieces of editing and cutting that I've ever seen. And that's this like trio of happenings, right? So you have Evelyn who's going back to the the town to get medicine for the kid and get oxygen for the baby. And then you have the girl and Killian Murphy's character who are walking toward to try to go get a boat. And then you have the kid who's back there with the baby who decides he's going to go wander and see what else is in this place, which dumb move, but that fit for this kid's character. So this was genius editing because you have all three of these things happening and you just kind of keep it keeps cutting between the three. And I'm like, well, and every time you get to a moment where you feel like something tense is going to happen with one, they cut to the next. And then you get to that same moment and it cuts to the next and then it cuts. The level of tension for about 10 or 15 minutes while you're watching, nothing's happening. It's just three fucking people walking in different places. But I was so uncomfortable yeah. in those 10 to 15 minutes because you're just anticipating. And then they cut away. And then you're anticipating. And then when it all happens, it all happens at once. The kid sees the dead wife, falls over, makes a bunch of noise. Here comes a monster. They catch Killian Murphy's character at the end of the dock. They strap the bottle fucking shit to him. And now you're like, oh, my God. And then the scene with the freaking sprinkler, when Evelyn saves the kid with the shooting the oxygen tank. Oh, my God. That was bad bitching and badass. What and a it cool just fucking emerges scene. from the flames. Yeah. Oh, you're like, oh no, it's dead. And then she has not to do only, this little dance around it. Oh. Not only do they do it really well there, they use it effectively another time in the movie. Like they they use that same like technique of cutting back and forth as the story's progressing and the tension is building that towards the end too. And it's done yeah. really well there as well. Speaking of the end, so they make it to this island. Talk about the biggest like deep breath, everybody's safe, except for Evelyn and the fucking kid. This movie like twisted me up so bad because I'm like so comfortable because they make it to this island and those two are safe. And then you're like, but what about the mom and the kid and the baby? Don't just fucking have some tea and sit by the fire. What are you fucking doing? Yes, dude. When they first saw it, I was like, oh, this is going to be like the village or something. These people are crazy. Right? They've been on an island by themselves for who knows how long. These people are insane. They're cannibals. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then yeah. it's like, nope, they're just normal suburban people. Just yeah. normal people. I was like, oh, thank goodness, because I can't handle this. <laughs> I'm like, they're luring people in, right? That's why they got the radio playing. They're just luring them in so they can eat their livers. Well, <laughs> but no, thank goodness, have, that's not. I have a question then. Wouldn't the like actual bad people cannibals notice like the light and sound from this island and go check it out? I wondered that same thing. Other than my thought is, is they if they have their setup and then they have to get on a boat and then the most you just I think they kind of get lucky too these two because you kind of got to float your ass out to that island. You don't see how they steered it. You obviously yeah. can't turn the boat on because once you get somewhere, if you don't okay. end up, yeah, it's scary. Swim easier for the dock cannibals to wait for people to figure out the message because they're becoming you know twos or threes probably and you just leave the boats out there all nice and pretty and then you take your little you know little girl that's a demon child and have her go you know lure people in and then slip a rope over their neck that's dirty, Alec. I didn't even yeah. think about that because Jaiman Hans, whose character says we've been waiting and everybody been giving up. How many people got wrecked at that fucking dock? Trying See, to get I survived out there? Two weeks oh, because I think like a crazy person. So. Dude, Alec, you think too much like a crazy person. Are you okay? That's what I'm telling you, dude. I got like two weeks. I'm I'm okay. <laughs> dude, I'm calling you when this shit happens. <laughs> that shit, that shit's your, dirty. Your brain dude. and my guns? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude. Oh yeah, you no, just gotta honestly, survive the meteor. As <laughs> not happening, right on my chest. <laughs> Boom. As soon as I figure out these things can't swim, I'm doing donuts in a speedboat. <laughs> right? Just like having them jump in this lake. That's Absolutely. Fair. Yeah, because we watched the one drown. Can we talk about the moron that is Jaiman Honsu, Honsu's character, though? Shut the fucking garage door, you goddamn asshole. Look, I know it's not going to stop that thing, but at least, like, I get it. You're worried about your family. You have this moment where you have this badass moment. He was the calmest motherfucker on the planet. Puts the kids in the closet, which was the creepiest fucking scene, because Killian Murphy just puts his hands to his face. and Does sh- everyone whisper that way? Seriously, like, it shit was weird. And then... They run to the car, and this dude's just standing calm as a fucking everything, honking the horn, getting this creature to chase him on the island. Takes off running. He never breaks until the moment he gets in that building and he thinks that it hasn't followed them, and then he loses his mind, which I get that's fair. It makes sense. Now he's worried about his family. He thinks, at worst, I'm going to die, right? And, oh, my God, you're such a badass. And and then I'm like, in my head, I'm like, close the fucking door. (laughs) I'm like, can we have this conversation inside in hushed, whispered tones? Yeah. And then Killing Murphy finally gets the key and they get I into the radio station. Give me the key. Yeah. Give me the, the key. key. Shut the fuck give, up and give me the key. Give me the key. <laughs> what a crazy moment. But yeah, then they get in and I was thinking about Javier. So Javier brought up, we were having dinner after we watched this movie. And Javier was talking about the radio station and how it's, you know, it's been there. It's dilapidated and it'd be all squeaky and shit. And then I started thinking about it. It's only been a little over a year since this whole thing happened so it's not like a lot of this stuff's gonna be you know it's not like we're talking about 10 years from now when nobody's been in this place or it's only been a little over a year i just thought it was very inconvenient that the one time a door squeaks in this whole movie is at that moment you know and it's not just like a squeak it's like a like a freaking screeching (laughs) yeah Although but, it does yeah. help to like in the first wrap up. Movie it was a nail, and this one it's a screech. <laughs> Although it does kind of wrap up Killian Murphy's kind of character development because at the beginning of the movie, he's not doing anything for anybody. He only mm-hmm. like comes down once he realizes they know how to kill these things. And then in the radio tower, or whatever it is, like he jumps through a window to oh, unlock man. this thing. But that's a soundproof room, right? Is that why he yeah. jumps in and closes the door? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, he, that kind of wraps him all up to where, yeah, he's he's a he's a good guy now. Or that was not lost on me. That little character arc right there, because he had a choice, right? Like I could just back up, I could leave. That was very cool. It goes back to what JJ was saying because the whole time this radio station thing is happening, the mom and the boy and the little baby are again running out of oxygen. The things come in and it's like actively attacking, and I'm pretty sure it takes a big chunk out of Emily Blunt's leg. Like yeah. to the point where she almost rips it, rips her right out. Um, it took Reagan way too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way too freaking long for what was happening. I will give you that. That part, I was like, "What are you doing?" But then it was like this badass moment for her. So she's like reveling in this moment where these things can't do anything. And then like the way she just like slams her implant against the microphone. 
But I will say the visuals of her and her brother like having their moments, mm-hmm. and especially it cuts back to that beginning where the first movie Krasinski said he wrote as a love letter to his kids. Like you see that coming even more full circle to where they now get their moment. The son overcomes his fears. He walks out like a little bitch and badass with that radio. Like just casually, mom yeah, just casually brother, yeah. grabs the freaking handgun and walks up to this thing like a little badass. Then she grabs this like power outlet pole and just like shoves Dude. it right in the middle of this thing's head. No, oh. she doesn't stab. She freaking baseball bats this thing's head in half. Oh yeah, with a pipe. It was epic. How hard did she hit this thing? Or is this like a zombie skull? Well, <laughs> it's a zombie skull that just mushes after a high fall. Just mushes. <laughs> yeah, and then she has to like pry the fucking thing out of his head at the end of it. Oh, yeah. I loved the visual of that moment. Like the slow-mo. I hate slow-mo, as I've said over the last two freaking Zack Snyder films. But this moment, that slow-mo was perfect. Yeah, that was really cool. That's, That's how you nice. use slow-mo, Snyder. Call John Krasinski. He'll give you some notes. And then finally, the last thing I love about both of these movies is John Krasinski does not give a shit. This man will end on the biggest cliffhanger and not planning. Again, there's not a planned third. I'm sure there will be, but there's not a planned third. So this man just does not give a fuck. He ends it at the most awkward moments that you're like, now what? Wait, I got no resolution. (laughs) There's no resolution in his movies. And I love every he second of it. Double middle fingers us and yeah. moon walks away. I would Crazy. be perfectly happy if they didn't make a third one. Yeah, because like you can you can imagine read some fan fiction about what happens next, right? Like that's what's <laughs> great about those kind of endings, is it can be whatever you want. But you can say it worked, right? And like then people started figuring out so I killed all these monsters, or it didn't work. Yeah. And this is literally like this island and like that warehouse are the only places on earth. That I've figured this out, right? Like, there's a million ways you can imagine how this worked. It's amazing. I love it. All right, let's rate this thing. Javi, what do you oh, think? Damn off, it. Buddy? Don't make me go first. Uh, okay. Don't make me go first. All right. Okay. So, it's really hard for me to rate movies that I'm terrified of, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so, the last movie I rated really high because I really liked that movie. And it doesn't have as many jump scares as this one does. And I like the like slow build tension that this one also has. I'm going to give this, I'm going to give it a four and a half. Really, really good movie. That half that's missing for me is the fact that I don't like being scared. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not Jurassic Park. So like, Fair enough. what am I supposed to do? Yeah, I'm going to give it a four and a half. Honestly, an awesome movie. Like, as much as I've been saying how much it scares me, it's not a horror movie still. It's still, like, a suspense movie that tells a really good story and has really good characters and character development. Because normally, when you watch horror movies, it's one or the other, right? Like, you have crazy jump scares and horror and gore, and there's not much else. Or it's a horror movie that's not really... Anyway, I would watch this again after some time. (laughs) <laughs> I need to watch the beginning of this. So I'm going to watch this again, probably when, when I can like rent it or I can stream it. I'll watch it again then. So what? Probably a couple months out from now. So anyway, yeah, that's my score. Four and a half. And yeah, I'll watch it again. Perfect. Alec. All right. I will never be watching this movie again. This, this scared me to death in the theaters. So can't, can't do it. And I feel like watching this outside of theaters, unless you have a really impressive sound system, kind of misses a lot or takes a lot away from it because of the excessive use of sound and the great use of sound or lack thereof. So, yeah, I won't I won't go back and see it again in theaters. <laughs> I'm a huge scaredy cat. Never going to happen. But it was a great movie. So I enjoyed it. And I'm glad I saw it. Just won't be seeing it again i'm gonna go a four i'll go a four with it it was uh it was a great movie it's not up there to where uh, you know i'm gonna watch this every day and not get tired of it which is where i put the fives plus five has to be able you know i gotta watch it with grandma and i would give her a heart attack from jumping up and down seeing this with her so i'm, I'm gonna stick four but great movie fair enough ian yeah so i well, i loved this movie um i loved the first one and i don't know that i can necessarily enjoy this more like it's not one that i feel like i can rate one's better than the other but the storyline the character development the acting 
the visuals, the sound, like all of these different things kind of coming together, the use of tension in like applicable and realistic ways. And I really enjoyed this movie. And it's been a long time since I've used a five, but I'm going to give this one a five because I even just talking through it, how much I enjoyed discussing this movie with you guys. And I've already like made plans to take members of my family and go see it again because I want to see it again. So yeah, I'm giving a five and I'm definitely rewatching this one. Nice. Just to finish up, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I adored it. I thought it was fantastic. I'm so glad I've seen it twice. I will probably see it a third time in the theater because I, I I'm with you, Alec. Like I have a cool sound system. I'm getting a really, really nice TV. Like I could watch it at home and it would be effective. I've watched the first one at home many times and it's really good, but there's nothing quite like being surrounded by the just unbelievable loud audio of a movie theater. And then in on the flip side, the absolute perfectional use of silence that John Krasinski has mastered in these two movies. I it, it's, there's nothing like it being in a pitch black theater and you can hear a pin drop. Like it's, it's one of a kind experience, it, you know, and this movie does it in my opinion, better than the first one, which I didn't think was possible. I was more uncomfortable in this movie than I was in the first one, which I didn't think was possible. Minus not having John Krasinski, because that guy just chews up scenery whenever he's on a screen. I love him and everything he does. I've even considered watching The Office just because Krasinski's in it, and that's just not my kind of show. (laughs) But I love John Krasinski, and I think even without him, he's only in the beginning of this movie, but the fact that he could make me like these other characters as much as I like him. And then Emily Blunt's just a badass in this movie. She was in the first one. She is again in this one. I love Killian Murphy. I think he played his part well. This movie was fantastic. I have nothing but great things to say about it. And you can tell when I'm arguing with Javier about things that I normally would have gripes about that I was arguing to make sure that they weren't gripes in my own mind because that's how much I love this movie. So I'm with Ian. I'm giving it a five. It's a step up. I only gave the first one a four and a half. To me, this one's a better movie, in my opinion, because of how much more character development they were able to do because we already had the groundwork laid of these characters in the first one. So the tension was better. The characters were more believable. I I just loved this movie and I will see it many, many times. And at least one more time in the theater, because it's just amazing. So there it is, guys. Four and a half, a four and two fives. Very high scoring movie. This may be our highest one yet. I'll have to look into that. So great stuff. Go check this movie out. It was a lot of fun. Been one of our longer reviews, too. So been fun. Alec, dude, thanks for joining us, man. Oh, always. I love the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So getting to be a part of it uh, before the episode gets released is nice. Get to get it on the ground floor. But I love listening every week and I can't wait for the yeah the sneak peek. Can't wait for the TV series to take back up again so I can get more episodes in a week. One's not enough. I've had to go back and start listening from the beginning. <laughs> Hells yeah. No, well, man, we appreciate we it. You you, Alec. <laughs> like, we had that conversation at dinner, wasn't it? Where you were like, he was like, yeah. Alec is the fan that He's we the, don't deserve. <laughs> oh, yeah, not The one that we need or something. Like the Batman line. <laughs> and the yeah, Batman the line. Thing. Yeah, it was great. Plus, it's real fun just to come in and, you know, throw shit at Javier. Hell yeah. No, we love so having easy. you. And I look, I look we forward every week that. to your comments. And yeah, we we make a habit out of that too. He's like yeah. our, our our podcast it's, punching bags. So. Yeah, it's, it's too easy. It's too easy. Yeah. And if only he was here to defend himself, he did have to yeah. step out. So <laughs> that's, that's why I'm doing it now. Not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as always, everyone, thanks for tuning in. Go check us out on our uh, social media: YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Communicate with us. Leave us comments. Follow Alex Suit. Leave us. Tell us what you think of the movies. We want to hear so we can add it in. We'll read your comments. Leave us a review. We'll read those as well. We appreciate it. Yeah, email us, host at whatsourverdict.com. Go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, purchase some merch, help support the podcast. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next one. Cinemagic out. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Thanks, Alex. Cinemagic out. (laughs) 